So muscle, for example, responds, gets healthy and grows at any age. At any age, doesn't matter if you're 20 or if you're 80. Whenever you start, it's the right moment. So start now. I mean, this is um, the beautiful thing about this whole lifestyle. And I always recommend my clients to have a self-care plan in place because we always put ourselves last. So I'm not talking about being selfish, but have a self-care plan and have it in place and do the things you need to do to have the life you want. Hi, I'm Linus Woods Mullins, and I love to help women to vibe, to be more vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered in midlife. So come on, let's vibe. You know, you hear a lot about the need for women as they get older to maintain muscle mass. And one of the things I hear about all the time is, well, I I know it's important, but I don't want to look like I'm a sumo wrestler or things like that. But I can tell you that the reason why you want to build the muscle mass has really nothing to do with the way you look, per se, but it has to do with maintaining your overall quality of life. And so today we're going to be talking with someone who is an expert when it comes to the whole idea of women maintaining muscle. I have with me today... Angela. Angela is phenomenal. She specializes in helping women to maintain their muscle muscle mass by the wonderful fitness programs she has. She's a health coach and a personal trainer, and she really does understand the importance that it's not about aesthetics, but she empowers women to build muscle and cultivate healthy habits and achieve lasting well-being, sculpting bodies and sculpting lives. That's what Angela Beyer is all about. Thanks so much for joining us, Angela. It's wonderful to have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you, Linus. I'm so excited to be here. Well, you have really established some proven methods that have helped women and inspired women to really help with their transformation of being stronger. And and, and even though you're beautiful and you have this muscular body, that's not necessarily all of the types of clients that you have. That's not what they're going for. They're going for trying to stay in shape so they can have a really healthy life as they age. Why is it so important for women to be concerned about their muscle mass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this question. Muscle is the organ of longevity. It starts with the muscle. And unfortunately, when we have stuff going on hormonally, bone issues, metabolism, oh my goodness, like insulin resistance, for example, is like huge in women right now. And we approach it from the wrong side. We need to look at the structure of the muscle cell. Meaning, if we don't have healthy muscle tissue, which actually communicates, for example, with, for example, with the bone, like the body has to carry the healthy muscle tissue, so it's going to build healthy bone structure. So mm-hmm. you have healthy bones. The muscle communicates with your endocrine system. So mm-hmm. you are producing healthy hormones and you have a balance because it's the structure. Now, the muscle also is, I would say, the glucose sponge of the body, Mm -hmm. meaning like if you eat and you put carbs and fats in, this is energy and especially carbs, but they need to go somewhere. And if you don't have healthy muscle tissue, healthy cells, so when the insulin gets produced, the insulin comes and opens the key, the the key to open the muscle cell to get the glucose in. If this tissue is not there or is damaged because it hasn't been used, the insulin can do the job and the glucose stays in the bloodstream, goes back to the liver, spills over, and we create visceral fat, the belly fat we don't want. I was going to say, hence belly fat as a result. And I hear you, I'm wondering if I'm hearing you say something else. 
And this is kind of a, a quick summary. If you're eating carbs, you need to be making sure you're working out as well. That strength training is a, an important part. I know that as we get older, sometimes those cravings come and some of those cravings are hormonally driven. Some of them are lifestyle driven. But bottom line is that if you're older and still eating carbs the way you might have been eating carbs when you were in your 20s, if you're not working out <laughs> and lifting weights and getting strong the same way you would be like when you were in your 20s, that's going to be an issue. And mm -hmm. most women, when they, you know, look at their workout regime and what they want to do, aren't necessarily looking to work out the way they're 20s. And therefore, one of the main proponents and supporting factors of maybe not eating like you were 20. So it's right. kind of, right, there's I mean, kind of a, it, yeah, yeah, kind of a hand in glove fit. We have to use wisdom, but there are things that we can do that will give us uh, the muscle mass that we need to support us uh, in terms of where we are in our lives right now. Now, I know one of them is resistance training. Uh, first of all, what is resistance training? And why is that one of the most important ways for women to get strong? Yeah, well, you hit very important points. First, you have to earn your carbs. Yes, I want to go back real quick to this because it's yeah. fascinating. Um, you have to earn your carbs. Yes. Now, when we get older, two things are happening. We get anabolic resistant, meaning we have a harder time building muscle because the the body is not responding as quickly anymore as you did before. So you have to build an early foundation and you have to keep it up. So consistency is key. And then in order to trigger muscle protein synthesis, listen to two things, you have to have a higher protein intake. So coming back to the carbs, a really important tip is when you fill up your plate, always eat the protein first, mm. get the protein in. Then get your fiber in. And then by that time, to be honest with you, by having more protein, you're not as hungry. It is having like a real good satiety effect. So right. you're not looking at the carbs as much. So mm -hmm. for example, if you're at a restaurant, always the bread comes first. Yes. And yeah, just say, okay, let's keep the bread till the end. And if I'm still hungry, you can have the bread. Most of the time you're not. So right. just as a little tip, if you are struggling with the carbs, like just switch around protein first. But yeah, now to the strength training or what is resistance training, mm -hmm. you want, as the name says, have quite a bit of resistance. You want to challenge the muscle tissue. You want to make the muscle work to the point where it has to adapt. And women are always scared to lift heavy weights. And there are those myths that they bulk up and yada yada. And I understand the concept. I come from a competitive uh, background. I did bodybuilding competitions. And um, that's how I actually got my green card. Um, I represented the United States at the Miss Universe show. And I was able to get the title for the USA. And it, it was one of the biggest moments. But that being said, like I have a bodybuilding background and I'm very good at sculpting bodies. But what I see is the sculpting and like focusing on the resistance training brings you the health. Mm -hmm. It goes hand in hand. And that uh, emphasizes the whole concept, how resistance training adds to a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Now, resistance training means heavy. I have so many clients who have the five pound dumbbells, don't want to get to the 10 pounds. And you know what I ask them? What's that? Do you have a toddler at home? Most of the time it's either <laughs> the child or the, the grandchild. And they're like, yes. I said, well, how old is the child and how heavy is it? Well, it's like three years old and right. 40 pounds. I said, okay, so you're lifting 40 pound toddlers, but you don't want to lift 10 pound weights. You yeah. It's so, it's so interesting that you say that because I'm getting ready to go visit my grandchildren and um, uh, they live in Texas. I have six grandchildren. Three of them live in Texas and they are uh, under the age of 10. 
And so one's three, one's 18 months, the other one's not uh, oh. nine or something like that. Now, the nine-year-old is heavy and big. I don't even try to pick him up. The other two, I think one is like 25 pounds and the other one's like 20 pounds. The 18-month-old is like really like a little soon baby. I mean, he's really fat. Oh. Uh, so every time I pick him up, I can feel my uh, core engaging. I can yeah. feel my back muscles. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to have my workout gym with me like I normally do at because I have one at home that I can bring with me on my. But I thought, but you know what? I got my grandkids, so I will be lifting them up and carrying them and going up the stairs and going back down. It's interesting the yeah. different kinds of things in your everyday life that you can do and focus on that can help you with your strength training. Absolutely. But you can really say something. And um, yeah, you know, you hit the. The, a really good point because what is this all about? I want my clients to increase their health span, being able to play with their grandkids, being able to lift them up, being able to do the thing, going down on the floor and playing, mm -hmm. you know, or and being able to get back up from the floor. There you go. <laughs> That's the point. Yes. So we are so focused on increasing the lifespan or getting old and living a long life. Is it really the goal or is it the goal to live a long, healthy life, being able to do oh, all the Angela, things you want? I was just talking about this on an Instagram live the other day. There's, you know, I have a group on Facebook, about 24,000 women. And there was this one lady who wrote something and I almost didn't approve. But I said, no, no, I'm going to approve it because I'm going to respond. And she was talking about how, you know, in midlife, she doesn't journal. She doesn't meditate. She doesn't work out. She drinks diet soda. She dyes her hair. All these things that you hear midlife women talk about that they don't want to do. And she said she doesn't want to be judged because of that. And I said, OK, you know, it's all about choice. On the same token, I don't want to be judged for journaling, meditating, doing yoga, lifting weights, eating right and everything else. Because in my 17 years of working with women, I have to tell you, it's not so much what you look like, it's what the quality of your health is like. And I'm wondering if you continue living the way that you're living, when you get to be my age, because she's in her 40s and I'm 67, will you be able to lift weights? Will you be able to pick up your grandchildren? Will you be able to get up off the floor? You know, all of these things that you're doing right now that you pride yourself on doing because it's so different than everybody else may not give you the same kind of results later on that you want to have in terms of the quality within which you're living your life. So I really would like to hear your opinion about that, because when she brought that posting, I thought, oh, this is so against my philosophy of life, because I really do believe that given all the strides in science and everything else, we can live a long time. But will we be healthy? living that long time. And I'd rather live to 80 and be healthy and picking up babies and everything else. And then boom, my time is over than live to a hundred and just be a hot mess. <laughs> you know, yeah. and you know, Linus, this is, I mean, I actually looked up the numbers and interestingly in the United States, the average lifespan is 79 years. The average health span is 63 years. This is a huge gap where we not have quality of life. These are 20% well, of like not being independent, not doing the things you want to do, having health, like serious health problems. Huge. Yeah. So like for 16 years, you're still alive, but your life mm -hmm. is a hot mess. <laughs> hot mess. Yeah. And what is interesting too, I don't know why that is, but women have actually a longer lifespan yes but a shorter health span interesting yeah mm -hmm. interesting. so men go live healthy and go out with a boom does right. it and the women are actually having more health issues yeah and and I can see longer. how that is because we have a tendency to put ourselves on the back burner when it comes to health care uh, to, to our yeah. health care we have a tendency to put off things, you know, we're feeling these little aches and pains and things like that. And we don't do anything about it. And then all of a sudden we're sitting in the office with stage four cancer or something like that. Right. But not to be too maudlin because it's never too late to make some lifestyle changes, correct? No, okay. never too late. This is fascinating because the muscle, for example, responds, gets healthy and grows at any age, at any age. Doesn't matter if you're 20 or if you're 80, whenever you start, it's the right moment. So 
start now. I mean, this is um, the beautiful thing about this whole lifestyle. And I always recommend my clients to have a self-care plan in place because we always put ourselves last. Yeah. So I'm not talking about being selfish, but have a self-care plan and have it in place and do the things you need to do to have the life you want. And yeah, it doesn't matter what age you're starting because the beauty is the muscle loves to work and loves to move and responds to it. The only thing where we get into trouble, and this is where... I'm highly alert because sarcopenia, the, the loss of muscle starts in our 30s mm -hmm. and goes slow down. But what happens if, God forbid, we are bedridden mm -hmm. or some people go on vacation and just veg on the beach, that's bedridden, same kind of thing. You lose in a week between three and five pounds of quality muscle, Isn't which is a something? huge problem. I mm -hmm. have that experience a little bit. I was a dancer for many, many years. I stopped dancing when I was 60 because I didn't want to be one of those people on the stage. You're like, oh, she needs to sit down. It's a little bit too much. I didn't want to be one of those people. And actually, well, I, I it kind of snuck up on me. But all at one day, 64, I wake up and I'm like, whoa, what's this thing in the back here? This big old butt and the thighs and all that. And I was I was doing blocking. And I was doing strength training, but it wasn't the same thing as the kind of movement I had been doing. So then I, I got right. I got kind of worried about, OK, how how can I get this back? Because I, I literally don't have the same time frame that I've had before when I was going to all the rehearsals and dancing all the time. I just don't have the time frame anymore. So I came up with a workout plan that worked for me. And began to get things back into shape. I mean, it was a combination of consistency, not necessarily yeah. longevity, but consistency. And the other thing was, part of it was hormonal. Although mm -hmm. I'm one of those proponents that believe that if you're gaining weight after 60 or whatever, it's not just hormonal. It's all about what you're putting in your mouth and when you're putting it in, you know, what you're putting oh. in your mouth and when you're putting it in your mouth. I mean, that's the reality. I hate to break it to you, but that's the reality. So I had yeah. some changes in terms of what I was eating. One of the things that I did, I thought I was eating enough protein, but I wasn't. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your philosophy on protein and how much protein you think I need to be taking in. Let me see if I'm close. Okay. And okay. Now, okay. Just a little fun fact. The RDA, the recommended daily allowance in the United States, is actually based on, it's a funny number, on soldiers in World War II and how much the minimum protein amount is so they're still able to march. Okay. So then that's the number we are going with. In World soldiers War in World War II. Yeah. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a... I looked it up and I'm like, well, how is, where is this number coming from? And I'm like, wow, that's, that's fascinating. Actually, that's, it doesn't work like that. Of course not. So the protein intake is way too low, what most people do in the United States. And I like my clients to eat one gram of protein per ideal body weight, where they see themselves in an ideal weight not what they weigh on the scale. So where their ideal body weight should be. And another thing is very important as well, in order to actually trigger muscle protein synthesis. So you work out and in the workout, you're not building muscle. You're prepping the body to build muscle. You're building it only if you put building blocks in your mouth. Yes. And that's protein. Protein is made out of 20 amino acids. Nine are essential, meaning you have to get them through food. Just a little science <laughs> info. But so what happens is in order to trigger muscle protein synthesis, you need at least between 25 and 30 grams of protein per meal. The older you get, the higher it goes up. Right. So the more I'm protein you need. I'm doing about I'm doing about 30 per meal. Sometimes it's an effort Wonderful. because my appetite, mm -hmm. because of the other supplements that I'm taking aren't isn't as much. So I've got to get it through a protein powder. I use a vegan protein powder. What is your opinion about that? Because for a long time I was resistant of that because I wanted to get it through my food. But because I'm not a big meat eater, you know, I, I eat salmon, you know, some turkey, but these days, because of all the crap that's in 
all meats, basically. Yeah. I'm very careful about that. So what's your opinion about protein powders? How can we evaluate mm-hmm. what's a good one and what's not? Mm-hmm. Wonderful question. So again, I look at the amino acid profiles. And one thing, for example, what we need is in order to get muscle growth is um, at least three grams of loisine in a meal. Now, plants, unfortunately, don't have that. Now, what they did in protein powders, they combined different sources of plants, plant-based proteins, for example, pea protein, rice protein, hemp protein. Mm -hmm. So if you have a plant-based protein powder with different sources of proteins, high quality, I love it because it's very gentle to digest. You get a complete amino acid profile and it tastes delicious and it's easy and quick. I'd rather have my clients have protein powders and get their protein in than not and skipping. That's the worst yeah, you can do. I think, and, and to make sure that I get it in, even though I'm eating, I'm almost eating three meals a day, but I, I had stopped eating breakfast for years and years and years. I, you know, I was an intermittent faster and so I would only eat breakfast mm-hmm. maybe twice or whatever. And that was fine. But, you know, your body chemistry changes as you get older, not just hormonally, but what your body is able to produce in terms of the vitamins, the minerals and things like that. So you begin to need to find different ways to make sure your body's getting that either through supplements or changing what you eat. So I put breakfast back in there because I need to make sure that I was getting those grams. That was an easy way to get more grams of protein in my diet. I mean, to be honest with you, my take on, on intermittent fasting is, I mean, In order to get to the right body composition, to lose body fat, there are different ways. One is caloric restriction. Very Mm -hmm. simple. If somebody can do it, count it, restrict. That's what bodybuilders do. It's it's simple. The other one is cutting out certain food groups. So I'm not really for that because, as you said, we need nutrients. But some people have different diet styles. They cut out the carbs. They cut out... Like it's a different form of doing a diet. And then we have the time window, restricting our time window. The only thing you achieve with that basically is caloric restriction or having a schedule where you keep the calories low and that's helping you. Now, if it comes to protein intake, why are we doing this? We want to be balanced. Protein doesn't spike the blood sugar doesn't do anything. So you can get by with a protein meal, a protein shake, ideal. And what I always recommend, it doesn't matter what time it is, but your first meal of the day, that's when the body is primed. If it's at six in the morning, at nine o'clock in the morning, or at 12 in the afternoon or lunchtime, the first meal, that's when your body is primed, when it needs a robust protein meal. That's where you get the most out of it. And, and, you know, it's interesting because I get up very early in the morning, 4.30 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. And what I've been doing is something called 30, 30, 30. 30 grams of protein, 30 minutes of exercise within 30 minutes of waking up. When I first started doing this, I was like a Tasmanian devil in the morning. My husband was like, what is going on? So I was running around trying to fix the protein, running around trying to exercise, you know, (laughs) Until finally, I said, okay, Linus, use wisdom. If you're off by a few minutes, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Sometimes we can get so preoccupied with doing things just right, and then it doesn't quite fit into our lifestyle, and then then you you quit. You don't do it at all. So I said, no, I know there's something to this, so I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in a way that makes sense for my lifestyle. It doesn't drive my husband crazy that he can hear me running the blender, you know, all this stuff and running out. He's like, what are you doing? It's so early in the morning. Uh, So now I still do that. What I did was I put breakfast back in and I have my protein uh, shake and I have maybe a boiled egg, maybe a sourdough bread with avocado toast on it, you know, something, a little fermentation, a little omega-3 in there, whatever. And then I go for my walk for 30 minutes. And it's not within the first 30 minutes that I wake up. But what I do do when I first wake up, I don't sit down for an hour. I'm, you know, doing my, I I do my, uh, my prayers or meditation when I'm at the end, at the end of my day where I can sit down. But the first part of my day, I'm, you know, fixing my protein shake, fixing my breakfast or whatever, doing a few chores around the house, keeping myself mobile and moving. And then after that first hour, and the reason why I do that, let me get your opinion on 
on that is because as you get older, when you wake up, things are a little interesting, a little creaky. So I didn't want to like get up in the morning and then sit right back down again. I want to get up in the morning and begin to move, drink my lemon water. I always drink my lemon water in the morning and, you know, do, do, I have this ritual thing. I call it, call it starting your day in a positive way. As I got older, I realized that I need to make some changes to make sure that even though I want to do my prayers and meditation, I do it a little bit later because I don't want to get up and sit right back down again. I want to be able to, to move around. What are your thoughts about that? And how can that help? What kinds of rituals in the morning can help? us meet our fitness goals when it comes to just staying healthy? I love this question. So first of all, I think when we start of making lifestyle changes, we are all motivated. And then I get always the question, what is the secret, the secret sauce, the best workout, the best diet? To be honest with you, the best thing of all of it, I would say is discipline. Now, by creating a morning routine and making it a habit, I call it my habit stack. So getting up in the morning and have my little habit stack and being active and moving gets the body fluids going. I always say that like it it gets everything going. And I think it doesn't have, of course, it's always lifestyle dependent and what level you're at, but Mm -hmm. you don't have to do a high intensity workout first thing in the morning, but Mm -hmm. getting moving and being active sets you up for the day. And you have already something accomplished. And the body, how can I say, like, it it produces happy hormones. You have a complete different day when you have a habit stack, which you accomplish every day. And see, it's funny. I do my prayers and my meditation, my yoga as well in the morning. But after my workout, I do exactly the same thing. Oh, good. So I get a gold star or an Angela star. star. (laughs) <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, I think it's okay for us to see as our lives begin to change, to tweak it, you know, being married to a certain kind of like, let's say being married to a certain kind of healthy lifestyle that no longer is giving you the results or working for you is the same thing as like being married to a husband that's no longer giving results and working for you. At some point, yeah. you got to make a decide, am I going to stay married to this person? Or am I going to go to a counselor to make some changes? Or am I going to divorce this person? But to stay in it that way, when you know it's not giving you what you need, probably is not the best idea. So it's okay for you to make changes. That's what life oh, is no. all about. And midlife is all about transition and change. That's all it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, to be honest with you, if I think about it, how many times I changed my diet and I always thought, oh, that's it. That's the diet. I'm going to be on for the rest of my life. It's working. No, only to a certain point. And then I changed (laughs) and you evolve and you learn how your body works and you learn also to listen to your body. Oh, my goodness. It's so important. And I think because a lot of people are so detached. They don't even know how to feel healthy. They don't even know what it is to be energized in the morning or having a happy attitude. And you like, I I tackle my day and this is what I'm going to do. And like going through some changes and I always get the question, is it going to be hard making those changes, getting to a healthy lifestyle? Probably, but life is hard in general and that's okay. You know, I mean, we want to, yeah, challenge ourselves. You have some, I think about people who make the um, choice to have plastic surgery. Okay. Uh, That's hard and painful and it takes a while uh, to heal. And I'm not necessarily poo-pooing plastic surgery. I wouldn't do it, but I know there are those who do it. So it's the same kind of thing when making a healthy lifestyle change. Initially, it's hard. Sometimes can be painful, but the end result hopefully is something that you're pleased with. And then, you know, after a while, when 10 years later, whatever it is, that facelift or whatever you got starts sagging a little bit or whatever, and you're thinking about going and getting something else done, it's the same thing with the the lifestyles. You know, the results you were getting are beginning to change because our bodies are changing. And I know it seems absolutely ludicrous to compare a facelift to a healthy lifestyle, but I'm trying to relate to those folks who... (laughs) who are, you know, do those things and take themselves yeah. through these things. And it's thinking, well, if you take yourself through that, you can certainly take yourself through something that actually is going to glean you a uh, healthier and longer life, ultimately. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And that's huge. Yeah. 
Angela, it's been so great talking to you. Now, I know since you're on a podcast, you must have some kind of virtual programs. Can people work with you on online? How, how does that work? Yes, I do online coaching. And I have a course where I teach overall health, where you can make those lifestyle changes in nutrition, training, sleep, stress management, mindset, like it's a whole all around course. And then I do one-on-one health coaching as well. And I have a special program. This is my fun program. If you want to get ready for a wedding or for a special event and you show me the dress, we are going to have a workout plan for the dress. And in 12 weeks, I get you ready for the dress. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Now I know there's folks out there who will love that. You always hear people poo-pooing about, well, you don't want to work out just for that. But the reality is sometimes things come up. But now the good thing I, I, I suspect about your plans is the things that they're doing over three months. That's about the same amount of time it takes to change to a healthier habit anyway. So hopefully those things stick anyway. It's good to have a goal to get you to make the changes you want to change and and then to make that now your new lifestyle. Because sometimes when you make those changes and you achieve the goals, it's kind of like, well, I want to keep doing this. Who wants to go back? You know, we want to keep moving forward. Well, that is wonderful. And for all of you who are listening, definitely check out the show page, which which has all of her social media links so that you can go ahead and follow her on social media, learn more about Angela's wonderful programs, and hopefully get in touch with her and find out about getting in shape for that dress or that outfit for that homecoming, wedding, and all the other stuff that we have coming up. I think that's that's a wonderful goal to have. Angela, thank you so much for being on the Vibe Living Podcast. It's been great having you here today. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you for dropping in. I know there's a lot of podcasts you could be listening to, and it really means a lot that you've came to spend some time with us. Please take a look at the other podcasts that we have. We have some fabulous experts, just like Angela, who are willing to share with you their level of expertise and hopefully help you to find more ways to be vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered in midlife. In other words, finding more ways to vibe. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Have a fantastic day and don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Vibe Living Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment and share this podcast. Have a fantastic day and don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody.